the hand of God. It has to be the faithfulness of God. It has to be the goodness of God. It has to be the miracle working hand of God operating in our midst. God is on the move and you cannot stop him. No matter how many governments across time, space and culture try to conspire to stop the spread of Christianity, guess what? Christianity just keeps on getting stronger and the church keeps on getting bigger. This is the story of Christianity. That's why every single dictatorial one world government power across time, space and culture, they cannot handle the, but to persecute Christians. We have been around for a long, long time and we have survived so many different evil times, evil kings and evil eras. But in time like this, in a church with this side, at this moment of time, where I get to really try to ask or answer the question of, is this revival? Across the last 30 years in Australia, we've had the rise and fall of so many mega churches. So, so many mega churches came in the name of Christ and they filled buildings and they filled stadiums and they had bums on seats and they filled so many different major arenas. They built churches, they had excellent production, they wrote good music, but the real question is, is this revival? And more than anything, is this real revival or is this fake revival? Uh, is this hype revival or is this holiness revival? Is this a revival inspired by the Spirit of God or is this a revival inspired by the work of man? I like to go to Jamberu every now and then and what's really interesting about Jamberu is that you go on one end, this machine that is able to literally create fake waves of water. But a few kilometers down the road, you go to the sea and the sun is shining and the wind is blowing and you see God moving the wind to move the wave. The exact same way there are two types of revival. So many people are able to create a fake man-made revival that is not a revival of holiness, but a revival of hype. And people need a lot of discernment to realize that just because you have a lot of people in church, it does not mean it's revival. Just because you're able to feel buildings, it does not mean you're, this is revival. Just because there's a lot of numbers on, in your database, it does not mean it's revival. Just because you're able to fill your building and get another building after another building, it does not mean this is revival. Because there is real revival and there is fake revival. There is hype revival. There is holiness revival. There is a spirit of God revival. And a man created revival. In the exact same way, you can go to the beach and enjoy the wind of God blowing for you to enjoy the waters. You can actually go down the road to Jamberu and enjoy a, fake, a good old fake wave. And you need a lot of discernment to try to figure out which one is a God's revival and which one is a fake revival. I'm kind of trying to tackle these questions because what is revival? Is revival simply people coming to church and shaking on the floor and speaking in tongues, la 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 la, and then the fire and, and the preacher coming here like power, power, and people start shaking and falling on the floor. Is this revival? Is revival some famous guy traveling from the other side of the road and then they like do that one and before you know it, everybody's shaking on the floor and they tell you that your bank account number and you start shaking and you feel this number. Is this revival? What is revival? Uh, it's a really important question because one of the biggest things as Christians we tend to disagree on, we agree on everything, but we just tend to disagree on the definition. <laughs> what is Revival. In the book of Acts, we kind of encounter the first moment in the history of the church where revival actually happened. It's quite a, an important moment in the history of the church, Acts 2. And I find it shocking how many churches and people or even revivalists, real or fake, godly or not godly, claim to have revival, yet they don't follow the mechanics, the process, and the boundaries of Acts chapter 2. Uh, uh, Apostle 
one of the disciples, Apostle Luke, wrote the, the book of Acts. He was kind of not one of the 12 disciples. He was part of the extended disciple, the 70 disciples. He was a doctor and investigator. type. He kind of wrote uh, Luke, Luke, the first book of Luke, which was kind of about the work of Jesus. But then part two of the book is the book of Acts, which is about the, the work of the Holy Spirit. And you kind of jump in Acts chapter two where you get to see the first moment when the church is started. The first moment when the church is planted, how to plant a church, how to start a church, how to initiate and breathe a God movement. How does God move? So it's quite important that in the book of Acts, we see this moment of Pentecost, this moment of revival when the presence of God fell so thick in the room that so many people got saved. 3,000 people got saved. So many people got saved that, that, that Christianity spread like fire by the millions from person to person, from family to family, from town to town, from nation to nation, to country to country. Eventually it became an enemy to the one world order of the Roman Empire that they had to shut it down. I'm saying revival happened in that moment that Christianity spread like fire. It spread like fire from country to country, to nation to nation, from town to town, from person to person, to family to family. So the Roman one world government at the time that ruled the whole entire existence of the human race at this point of time had to try to stop it. And the religious establishment of the time that loved churchianity but not Christianity had to try to contain it. That's what happened and we kind of jump in Acts 2. It's really, really important because we get to encounter the first sermon in the history of the church. And tonight I'm going to dig into particularly the feelings and the mechanics of what happened in that sermon. Peter preached that first sermon to 3,000 people, to thousands of people. And on that particular day, the Holy Spirit rocked up and 3,000 people got saved. This was the first moment of revival. But more than anything, you get to see what Peter made the people feel. That's why I want to I wanna, I wanna really talk tonight because one of the biggest tragedies in our contemporary church and what I call the woke progressive church, there's a lot of them around this in Australia. Yeah. Most of the church in Australia are progressive and woke. Yeah. What do I mean by that? They are culturally relevant, yeah. but they're not very biblical. Yeah. So as a consequence, they always preach revival, yeah. but they don't preach repentance. Wow. They always want the Holy Spirit to come, but they don't teach people about holiness. <laughs> they always speak about salvation, 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 but they don't say the word sin. I call it the gospel of oopsie whoopsie. Have you ever seen that? You know what? You made a mistake against God. I'm like, seriously, brother, you made a mistake. So God killed his own son for an oopsie whoopsie mistake. That's to be extreme, right? That's the gospel of oopsie whoopsie. You didn't sin, you did an oopsie whoopsie. So they preach salvation without sin. They preach revival without repentance. They preach Holy Spirit without holiness. And they preach spirituality without the scripture. And there's a lot of them around. <laughs> For them, hell is like the swear world. Yeah. They never preach about hell. So firstly, they removed hell. Yeah. There is no hell. Yeah. Like we don't want to scare people. Wow. Hell is so scary. So we're going to act like there is no hell. Wow. So firstly, they remove hell. Then they remove sin. Yeah. Then they remove conviction. And finally, they no longer preach repentance. Wow. I'm saying that's how they do it. Firstly, they removed hell because it's scary. We want to be more inclusive. We want to be more diverse. We want to make sure the gay community, LGBTQ, ABC. You know what? God didn't rain, you know, fire from heaven on Sodom and Gomorrah. He was raining like, you know, popcorn. So we're going to remove hell because it's scary. Hell is so scary. So firstly, they removed hell. Which is the reason people actually turn to God. People turn to God for three particulars. Is it God's love? But a lot of people also turn to God because of fear. Wow. Because hell is for real. Yeah. That's why I'm a Christian. People tell me Jesus loves you. I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> Some people turn to God because of his love. Or my emotional people. 
Some people turn to God because of fear. And there's nothing wrong with that. Because hell is for real. And some people turn to God because of reward. Yeah. Like little dogs. You know, I have a little dog. Every time she sits, I give her a treat. So every time I come around, she sits, I can give her more food. I'm like, it doesn't work that way. It's really important that we kind of jump in Acts where we see this moment of revival and we see the initiation and the establishment of the church. But more than anything, this is really important, I want you to understand. More than anything, in Acts chapter 2, we see the first sermon in the history of the church. And how can you preach the gospel without actually understanding this first sermon? How? How can you understand who God is and who God isn't? How you understand how to preach and how not to preach, what to preach and what you shouldn't preach? How do you understand how you're supposed to make people feel? Until you understand and study that Acts 2 where you see the first sermon in the history of the church that led to 3,000 people being saved on one night. They started a mega church in one night. (laughs) And led to a revival for tens of years. That the Roman Empire had to kill Christians and shut it down because it was spreading too much, too fast, too quick, and they couldn't control it. Amen. Peter comes to the people of God and he kind of comes and he tells them, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit. Can I tell you something? We are living in the midst of the last days. Every single moment that passes by, every single day that passes by, Jesus is coming back. And this is the good news. Even if you don't think we are in the last days, we are closer than ever to the last days. So God's Spirit is coming. I know in the last days it's going to be dark. It's going to be the Antichrist. It's going to be gay, perversion, gender man, gender woman, gender bender. And as you go to the streets now, you see naked people like, what is going on? This is Sodom and Gomorrah 2.0. So in the last days, it's going to be Sodom and Gomorrah. Noah, it's going to be crazy people walking in the street naked. Like, what is going on, bro? Put something on. But the exact same way Jesus promised that in the last days, God's Spirit is going to go loose. God said it this way, in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit on every single person. If you're old, if you're young, if you're white, if you're black, if you're rich, if you're poor, if you have everything, if you have nothing. God is ready to pour out his spirit. This is the promise of God. I will pour out my spirit and young people will have the courage to preach and old people will have the dream to keep on going and young people will have the courage to plan churches and older people will have the strength to keep on going. This is what the Holy Spirit does. Come on, anybody here wants a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit? If that's you, would you lift your hand up? The Holy Spirit, fill us afresh one more time. We want more of you, Holy Spirit. We want more and more and more. We want more of you, Lord. More of you. We want, we, we want more of you, God. We want to be full yes, Lord. to have a flow. Yes, Lord. Come on, anybody here wants to be full yeah, yeah. to have a flow. Come on. Come on, when the Holy Spirit comes, you can't stop him. He will mess your world. He will shock your world. He will shake your identity. He will destroy your planned destiny. He will do something. You know, when we started this church, we didn't have the money. We didn't have the people. We didn't have the skill. We didn't have the building. We didn't have the venue. We didn't have the resources. We didn't have the skill. We didn't have the lawyer. We didn't have the builder. We didn't have anything. But all we had was the spirit of God. And this is the crazy thing about the Bible, that Jesus did not promise his disciples that he would send them some money, or he would send them some cash, or he would send them a lawyer, he would send them a building. Jesus promised them that when I go, I will send my spirit. (laughs) Jesus, what did you like? Leave us some cash so we can buy a building. Or leave us some like experts. Or leave us some like leadership books so we can manage the people. No, 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 no. When we started the church, we had nothing. The photo's gonna come on the screen. All we had was the Spirit of God and the Word of God. I'm saying all we had was the Spirit of God and the Word of God. All we had was God. 
all we had was Jesus. And this is the beauty of Jesus. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Everything minus Jesus equals nothing. I'm saying Jesus plus nothing is everything. Everything minus Jesus is nothing. If all you have is Jesus, you are in the best place ever. All you need is a word from God. All you need is a word from God. All you need is the word of God. God. All you need is the word of God. All you need is a word from God. All you need is a word from God. All you need is a word from God and His Spirit. And He will tell you to go. And you gotta go. And that's why at the church we need a revival in our nation. <laughs> we need a Holy Spirit revival and a Holy Scripture reformation. This is really important. We need a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit to come on our people, to come into our land, to come into our churches, to come into our leaders and shake our world. And we need a fresh reformation that will return the church back to the truth of the scripture. <laughs> Can I tell you something? I always get attacks from people like, you're offending too much people. Hey speech, hey speech. Your speech is so not diverse. Your speech is so not inclusive. Your, your, your speech is so hateful. You keep on condemning people and you keep on offending people. And this is kind of the problem with this type of people. They fail to realize that the gospel will either offend you or make you repentant. A, little pe a lot of people have no idea about the true identity of the gospel. The gospel will either make you offended or repented. The gospel will either trigger you or transform you. I'm saying the gospel will either make you offended or repented. The gospel will either trigger you or transform you. And you get to make that decision. Oh my Gen Z, trigger warning, trigger warning, trigger warning. That is the purpose of the gospel. It will trigger you. It, it was going to trigger you. It's going to trigger you. And people need to understand that the gospel is more than enough. I'm saying the gospel is more than enough. You don't need to try to shake the gospel. You don't need to try to change the gospel. You don't need to try to put some sugar on the gospel. You don't need to try to make the gospel look more relevant and more cool and more cute because people don't want it. No, 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 no. The more you offend people with the truth of the gospel, the more people will come to Jesus. People fail to realize. The more you offend people with the truth of the gospel, they will get triggered so they can get transformed. In order for you to be transformed, you first need to be triggered. <laughs> and that's why the gospel will trigger you or transform you or will trigger you then transform you. And only you can make that decision. Only you can make that decision. And then the gospel will offend you so you can repent. Or it will offend you so you can leave God. A lot of people always say, look, you know, I don't come to church because of church hurt. Church hurt, church hurt. You have no idea what the other church did to me. You have no idea what this pastor did to me. You have no idea what this Christian did to me. You have no idea. I'm like, dude, this is the problem. When you go to heaven, that's not a good enough answer. I'm saying, you cannot go to heaven and tell Jesus, this church used me. That pastor emotionally abused me. Those Christians didn't like me. Yeah. And all the pastors have signed up with this false gospel. They're saying, we need to make sure that people not get offended by church so they can come to church. Yeah. Wow. This is so false because the gospel is so good and so beautiful and so amazing. It is so powerful. And one thing we see in the church, the more we preach the gospel, the more people come. Wow. I'm saying the more we preach the gospel, the more people come. And this is what the gospel is going to do. The gospel will either soften your heart to repent of your sin or harden your mind to reject God and hate the Bible. The gospel will either soften your heart to reject sin and follow Jesus or it will harden your mind and your self-righteousness to hate the Bible and hate God. And only you can make that decision. And this is the problem. Is that the Holy Spirit will convict you before he ever comforts you. 
I'm saying the Holy Spirit has to convict you before he comforts you. No, 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 no. The Holy Spirit will confront you before he convicts, before he, sorry, the Holy Spirit will convict you before he comforts you. The Holy Spirit will correct you before he comforts you. And this is the problem with most people. They think God is firstly going to make them feel good. But they fail to realize, no, 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 no. The Bible said when the spirit of truth comes, yeah. the first thing the Holy Spirit does is that he will convict yeah. the world Amen. of its sin. And this was the problem with the oopsie whoopsie gospel and the sinless gospel is that they preach salvation without sin. And without sin, there is no conviction. And with that conviction, there is no Holy Spirit. Yeah. And with that Holy Spirit, how can you ever know and encounter Jesus? Yeah. Because this is the job of a preacher. It's to preach the gospel. And this is the beauty, that the Holy Spirit is already going behind the scenes, convicting people and changing people. And that's why I don't need to try to sell you anything. I don't need to try to make the gospel a bit less, a bit more, a bit sugary, because the Holy Spirit is already... He's already convicting you. Do you understand? He's already there. Because the Holy Spirit has to correct you before he comforts you. And he will always convict you before he comforts you. And the same Holy Spirit that will give you peace in your darkest days, he will give you a storm in your sin. <laughs> The same Holy Spirit that will give you peace in your darkest days is the exact same Holy Spirit that will spark a storm in your soul when you sin. Because this is what the Holy Spirit does. He will convict you, trigger you, and you have to make a decision. Are you going to repent or be offended? Are you going to get triggered and leave church or be transformed? And you will not be able to go in front of the judgment seat of God and tell him these Christians were really mean. This church was really abusive. That pastor was really not nice. Those people used me and abused you. You will not be able to go in front of the judgment seat of God and say that you will not get away with it. Because you will not be judged based on what your church did. You will not be judged based on what your pastor did. You will be judged based on your, what you did. And your response to the gospel. <laughs> All my people who have been hurt by church, I'm really sorry what happened to you, but I'm here to liberate you for a second. It is not an excuse for you to not follow Jesus and not obey the scripture and build a church. I know so many people who have been hurt by church, I've been hurt by church before. It is not an excuse for you to reject the gospel, not obey Jesus and build his church. Because what I figured out, a lot of people hide their hate to the Bible and their disobedience to God under the umbrella of church hurt. This is really important. A lot of people, they hide their rejection of the gospel and their disobedience to the word of God under the idea of church hurt. And it's not that they were not hurt by church. They were hurt by church, but what they're doing is that they're making an excuse why they shouldn't follow Jesus. <laughs> and they think they're going to get away with it. You're not going to get away with it. When you go to heaven, if you make it to heaven, when you go in front of the judgment, instead of God, he will tell you, what did you do with the life I've given you? What did you do? What did you do with the Bible I've given you? What did you do with the gospel I've given you? What did you do with the free gift of salvation? And that's why... So the word progressive churches have removed sin from salvation. They have removed repentance from revival. They have removed holiness from the Holy Spirit. They removed hell and then they removed sin and there is no more conviction. And as a consequence, they do not preach repentance. So you, what you call now conviction, they call condemnation. I'm saying they call conviction, condemnation. But God will correct you and rebuke you as much as he encourages you. Come on, come on. So good. 
Do you understand that? You, you really have to understand, God will correct you and rebuke you as much as he encourages you and inspires you. This is really, really important. And what the work church did is that it removed hell to not scare people and they removed sin to make people feel good. And then, and then it removed conviction so people don't feel condemned. And then finally it removed repentance so people think they're saved, but they're not saved. They are not saved because without the repentance, there is no salvation. Yeah. I want you to quickly look at that interesting feeling. I love that moment. This is the first sermon in the history of the church. Acts 2 verse 37. How should people feel after his sermon? This is the best sermon in the history of humanity. 3,000 people got saved, boom. This is a revival sermon. Look what it said, it said, Peter's words pierced their hearts. It triggered them. It convicted them. It did something inside of them. It, It didn't make them feel good. It made them feel uneasy. It pierced. It's like, imagine having a big balloon and you pop it. And you hear that explosion. God's word pierced. The heart. And look what they said. They said, brothers, what must we do? I love this action point moment because a lot of people believe, 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 believe. (laughs) It's really important. You need to understand this. The gospel is not about reaching people. The gospel is about actually saving people. The gospel is not about reaching more people. The gospel is about preaching to more people the Bible. The gospel is not about making more converts. The gospel is about making more followers of Jesus Christ. Guys, one more time. The gospel is not about reaching more people. The gospel is about saving more people. The gospel is not just about reaching more and more people. It's about actually getting more people to repent of their sin and turn to God. The gospel is not just about reaching and reaching and reaching, but preaching the actual Bible. So you don't end up with false converts, but you actually end up with disciples. And this is so problematic. And that's what's happening in the Western church like now. That they have lost their courage and their strength to proclaim the truth of the scripture. This is really important. You know what the Holy Spirit does when he comes on you? He will give you courage, boldness, and authority. When the Holy Spirit is working in you, you'll have courage, boldness, and authority, and particularly when it comes to men. Because what's happening in the Western church at the moment is that we have an effeminate church and male pastors who act like women because they have been feminized without them even knowing. I can't just, how you know this is happening? Is that they value love, but not courage. They value empathy, but not strength. They value safe spaces, but not strength. I'm saying this is important. This is how you know you, as a man, you have been feminized and you're really feminine. You value empathy, but you don't value courage. You value compassion, but you don't value boldness. You value safe spaces. A lot of people, your church is not a safe space for the LGBTQ. I'm like, I'm not here to create a safe space. I'm here to create a holy space, bro. I'm not your mom. I'm not your mama. But that's what happens. See, it's beautiful when women act like women. But when men act like women, no, ugly, right? I'm saying it's beautiful when feminine women act beautiful and weak in a powerful way. Because that's who God created them to be. But when male pastors act like women and they don't even know it, wow. it's not really beautiful. Come on, come on. So, so, so they replace holiness yeah. with inclusivity. Yeah. Wow. We want to create an inclusive church. Jesus is not coming for an inclusive church. He's coming for a holy church. Yeah. It's really important to be what I'm saying. 
The gospel is so exclusive. <laughs> and they end up creating diverse community instead of truth preaching community. <laughs> we want a diverse community. I'm like, I don't want a diverse community. I want a truthful community. And finally, they end up creating an environment of tolerance instead of an environment for repentance. Wow. <laughs> I'm saying they end up creating an environment of tolerance rather than an environment of, of repentance. And this is really massive. Tolerance is not a Christian virtue. It's not. It's a secular value, virtue. It's a LGBTQ, ABC, amen, a woman virtue. It's an atheist virtue. It's a leftist virtue. It's just not a Christian virtue. You know what is the virtue of tolerance? The virtue of tolerance is to have no virtue. Wow. Because you tolerate everything. <laughs> it's like, I have no conviction. I have no values. So I have to tolerate anything and everything. Wow. This is what tolerance is about. Like, tolerance is the conviction of the people that have no conviction. <laughs> this is really paradoxical. It's like, what is tolerance? Tolerance is the conviction of the people that have no conviction. Yeah. And they're really passionate about it. Have you ever seen those people? We're all about inclusivity and diversity. We will exclude any person who's not inclusive. I'm like, how does that work? It doesn't make sense. We're like, we exclude exclusivity because we're so tolerant and diverse. And when you have a community run primarily by women, yeah. what you end up with, it's like, a, it's, like a, it's like a house with a lot of kids playing around. Yeah. This is really important. This is a psychological issue that is happening within the Western civilization. Yeah. Is that feminism has infiltrated churches. Yeah. Again, women are beautiful when they act like women. Yeah. But when men and leadership who's supposed to be strong, act beautiful, who's supposed to be courageous, yeah. remove courage and just say compassion, 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 and remove strength and just say safe spaces, safe spaces, safe spaces. And they remove boldness and replace it with empathy. You end up with weak churches yeah. that the devil is ready to destroy. And COVID and the last few years have been such a good moment for you to see, man, there was a lot of fake revival around. Wow. <laughs> One little tiny virus, the amount of pastors I meet, they're like, yeah, man, COVID hit us really hot. We lost half of our people. I'm like, really? Really, man? We have doubled every single year since COVID. Yeah. And this is really important. This is not a show off moment. Crisis show the character of a church. And most churches under pressure and crisis, they crumble and die. And, they're, they're, and it's, it's really crazy because it kind of got to show us how many fake revivals were around. Because, because when the spirit of truth came, the church multiplied. When the church multiplied, persecution happened. When persecution happened, the church multiplied more. So that was a real revival. <laughs> But when you have church multiplying and then persecution happens and then people run, that wasn't a revival. That was hype. That was not a revival. <laughs> it wasn't. That is the reason people are scared and yeah. people. Really Most churches care more about not offending people rather than not offending God. Wow. Most people care more about loving their neighbor instead of loving God more than anything and more than everything. Right. A lot of people care more about pleasing their friend rather than fr pleasing God. Yeah. Yeah. I'm saying most churches, in their pursuit of not offending people, they are offending God every single day wow. and they don't even care. A lot of people no longer love Christ in the pursuit of loving their neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of people no longer please the one that matters the most, Jesus. Because they keep on trying to please the culture around them. And this is what woke progressive Christianity does. Woke progressive Christianity 
It doesn't change culture to meet Christ. It changes Christ to match the culture around them. This is really important. Woke progressive churches, they don't interpret the world through the word. They change the word to match the world. (laughs) They don't see culture from Christ. They see Christ from culture. And as a consequence, they keep on putting down their conviction and their value. And before you know it, they value tolerance more than repentance. And this is how you end up with Mardi Gras, with Pride Month, with kids being indoctrinated, with little kids, the government telling the parents, if you don't affirm the gender, we're going to take them away from you. With little drag queens, gay men, dancing around kids. This is how you end with this shocking culture. It's because churches have not been preaching the gospel for a long time. For a really, 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 really long time. Because culture comes from Christ, not Christ from culture. And you'll have to make a decision. Is your goal to not offend people or to not offend God? This is really important. The Bible never ever talks about not offending people. It talks about not offending God. David said, test me, Lord, and know my heart and point out anything in me that offends you. (laughs) A lot of people, am I offending you? Am I offending you? Am I offending you? Am I offending you? I'm like, no, 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 no. When it comes to offense, your responsibility is to not be offended. Not to not offend someone. (laughs) <laughs> That's actually what the Bible says. Your responsibility is not to not offend people. Yeah. It's for you to not get offended. Okay. Because in the last days, the Bible said everybody's going to be offended. This, by the way, mark of the last days is that people will be offended from everything. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the reason you're not going to be able to preach the gospel. And this is the reason we're going to get persecuted. Because we're offending people. Wow. The cross is an offensive message. Literally, the, the cross was such a controversial piece of statement and art because if you were a Jew, there's no way your God died this barbaric death of a slave. And if you're a Gentile, noble people, when they got executed, they got beheaded. Crosses were reserved for the lowest and the lowest wow. and the lowest of society. Yeah. Uh, so the cross was a sign of shame dishonor and offense. And that's why when Paul preached a cross, people got offended. The gospel is offensive and you cannot do anything about it. I'm saying the gospel is offensive and there is nothing you can do about it. And this is, and this is really important, you know, and as you see around your culture, a lot of you have kids and your kids are like going nuts. Have you ever seen those kids like, I'm here, I'm queer, I'm here, I'm queer. (laughs) Or like living on stolen land, stolen land, stolen land, Gala Gala land, Wakanda forever. (laughs) All these kids going around and they're acting crazy. And I get a lot of people always tell me, why do you make fun of all these people in communities? This is really important. And this is really prophetic in essence. When the people of God not make fun of what is stupid, it eventually becomes sacred. Yeah. That's right. That's right. It's really important to be on set. Whatever you cannot make fun of, it will eventually become sacred. Wow. Yeah. When the people of God do not joke about stupidity and foolish ideas, it will eventually become the religious dogma of the time. And that's exactly what's happening right now. We have a lot of stupid ideas that the people of God never made fun of them. And as a consequence, they're becoming the religious dogma of our time. And I always tell people, man, do not take yourself too seriously. When people make fun of you and it's funny, you should laugh at it. Don't take your culture too seriously. You're not that important. Don't take your gender too seriously. You're not that important. Don't take yourself too seriously. You're not that important. Whatever people cannot make fun of, it's most likely the God that they worship. Yeah, wow. It's really important. So good. So good. That's why I love making fun of stuff. Because when you make fun of something, you end up realizing, what do actually people worship? What can't you actually make fun of? See, the only thing you shouldn't make fun of is God. Yeah. See, it's not just you shouldn't make fun of God. The Bible said God is not, should not be mocked. He cannot be mocked. <laughs> so when you make fun of God, dude, be careful because Nebuchadnezzar made fun of God. I'm the king. I'm the man. Look at me. Look at me. Next minute, God turned him into an animal. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, 
People don't turn into like Echo Church because it's a fun church. We don't take ourselves too seriously. Don't take yourself too seriously. Don't take your culture too seriously. Do not take your family values too seriously. Do not take your gender blender whatever too seriously. You don't take your sexual attraction too seriously. The only thing you should really take seriously is really God, his kingdom, his purpose, and his word. Have fun, man. I always tell people, I study the Bible, I preach the gospel, and I'm having fun on the way. <laughs> I'm just having fun. If you're not a funny person, you're not going to like Echo Church very much because we're actually laughing, Church. I know. You're like, oh my God, I cannot believe you made fun of that person. I cannot you believe you made fun of this LGBTQ ABC community. I cannot believe you made fun of the feminists. Oh my God, how dare you? How dare you make fun of people? I'm like, you are not God. You are not God. See, we're people. We're fallible. We're limited. We're imperfect. We're stupid. We make a lot of mistakes. That's why people will make fun of us every now and then. Yeah. And when people make fun of me, I just laugh with them. Yeah. So good. I don't even know if you're laughing at me or with me, but it doesn't really matter. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Don't take yourself too seriously because what happens when people take themselves too seriously, they get offended by the truth of the gospel. Yeah, that's true. When people take themselves too seriously, they cannot get confronted by the truth of the gospel. So the gospel is not about tolerance. It is about repentance. God is not planning to accept you the way you are. You can come as you are, but you will not stay as you are. Repentance is the condition of salvation. And the goal of the gospel is not just to reach people or to tell people, believe, believe, believe. But no, 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 no. They actually need to turn in order to believe. (laughs) That's why John the Baptist, his first sermon was repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. That's why Jesus, his first sermon ever, he was saying repent for the kingdom of heaven is here. That's why the first sermon in the history of the church, Peter said, repent of your sin. (laughs) This is the history of the gospel. (laughs) John the Baptist, repent, repent, repent. They ended up beheading him. (laughs) Like, why are you getting involved in the king's business? Like, why are you getting involved in people's sex life? Well, that's actually what John the Baptist did. The king killed his brother and married his sister. And, and John the Baptist told him, that's not okay. Yeah. That's not okay. Wow. That's wrong. Imagine Christians this day. Well, you should tolerate them. You should respect them. You shouldn't talk about it. So guess what happened? They ended up cutting his head off. Wow. Jesus said to the people, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is here. Yeah. They ended up killing him on a cross. This is the reality of the gospel. It is really, really offensive. And you have to make peace with it. Because if you don't, you will end up leaving Jesus for a stupid reason. You're going to be leaving God. They hate me. They don't like me. The media attack me. People don't accept me. I got fired. I got censored. I got kicked out. I got bullied. I'm like, whatever. This is the price of the gospel. That's why you sign up for. And if this is what you... And this is awesome. If this is not what you want, it's all good. Don't do it. But this is what you signed up for. It it is a mind-blowing reality how many people try to water down and change and manipulate the gospel to make people feel good when people in the Middle East, North Korea, China, and across so many different Muslim countries are getting killed for just preaching the gospel. Yet people here will water down the gospel just so that they cannot offend people. And just because they don't want to make people feel like they don't like them. Yeah, Yeah, hundreds of people are getting killed every year for them saying what you can say and not get killed. So God is not planning to tolerate your sin. God is planning to change your sin. God is not planning to leave you where you are. God is planning to take you somewhere. 
God is not planning to make you find yourself and be yourself. God is planning to make you more like Jesus. Because if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, I will open heaven. Echo is a word in the Greek that means to hold, to keep, and to God. If you read the book of 1 Timothy, I chose the name because it was cool, Echo. But if you go in the Greek language in the Bible, Echo means to hold and to keep and to God. And Paul was saying, hold on the pattern of truth and wholesome teaching. Amen. That word hold in the Greek is the word echo. Yeah. Come on. And I didn't know this was the prophetic calling of our church. Amen. To hold the truth of the scripture and not let it go. We are that John the Baptist type of church. Repent and be baptized. We are a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Echo is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Jesus is coming back and He's coming for a holy church. Jesus is coming back and it's time to repent.